When I first started using Lightburn, I got stuck a lot. So now that I've done a few dozen projects and have also consumed hours and hours of online tutorials and information about the software, I thought I'd come back and create the beginner's tutorial to Lightburn that I'd wish I had when I first got started. So today I'm going to show you all of the basics that you need to know in order to complete your first two projects inside of a fresh install of Lightburn. In fact, by the end of this video, I'm going to show you exactly how to create a custom name gift tag like this one and this adorable little hot air balloon design. And I'm going to do it in this way because I think working through real examples like this is really the best way to start to understand this type of software because we're going to be using the tools and features of Lightburn in context. Each of these projects will also demonstrate different tools inside of Lightburn that you're going to want to know for a lot of your projects that you're working on yourself. So with that in mind, here are the four main things that we're going to cover in today's video. First, I'm going to take you through an orientation of the navigation tools inside of Lightburn because this is where people typically get frustrated at the beginning because some of the tools aren't particularly intuitive, but if you know how they work, it becomes much simpler. Second, I'm going to take you step by step through exactly how to design a new project from scratch in Lightburn using this little name gift tag as an example. We're going to start from a blank screen and create this gift tag in Lightburn. And third, because I know a lot of people want to know how to bring external images into Lightburn and then to use them with the software, we're going to make this air balloon design by taking some images, importing them into Lightburn, and then using the trace feature in Lightburn in order to make this into a file that we can actually burn on our lasers. Fourth, we're going to go through three different methods of how to frame or align your material on the work bed. And I'm going to show you these different methods because depending on what your project is, one of them might work better than the other. But I wanted to give you several different options to make sure that you're going to be able to do this successfully the first time. Then we're actually going to burn out both of these projects. And at the end of the video, we'll take a closer look at the final results to see how everything turned out. So with that said, let's get right into the first topic. First up is navigation. As you can see, I've already opened Lightburn here on my computer, and I am going to assume that you've already installed it on your machine and that you've already run the setup for your specific laser. If you haven't done those steps yet, that's okay. I'm gonna leave a link in the description that's going to cover that process. So with that said, let's get into the navigation tools. The first thing you'll probably notice is this design space here in the middle with the grid on it. And you're also going to see your little pointer clicker that I'm moving around here. This is the default and this allows you to click on objects once you've created them and manipulate them. We don't have that yet. And one of the first things that you'll probably be frustrated by is if you try to click and drag, it's just going to do an outline. It's not going to move you around. And so if you want to move around the grid, you have to hold space bar and then you can click and drag. If you wanna zoom in, you can use these buttons up here, which will zoom you in and out, or I'm using a mouse that has a scroll wheel, so I like to just use that scroll wheel to zoom in and out. That's pretty convenient. And so those are the first couple things you're gonna to need to know. And the next thing you're gonna notice is this left-hand toolbar over here. This has a lot of things that you're gonna to use to create designs such as shapes, text, etc. So let's just start by selecting this little square box here so we can create a square. Now, what you're probably gonna to wanna to do next is be able to manipulate this square. But if you just have the square thing still selected, which is how it will be by default, if you try to click on this, what you'll end up doing is just creating more and more squares, which is pretty frustrating. And so what you have to actually do in order to manipulate the square that you've created is go back to the pointer tool here. And that will allow you to rotate it like this or to select the sides and expand it. And there's a lot of other things that you can do with this. If you have a tool selected like the square tool again, so I'm gonna create another square here, and you don't uh, take the time to go and, and select this pointer pointer tool, you can save yourself some time by just simply hitting the escape key on your keyboard twice. And that will take you back to the default, which is the pointer key. And so that will allow you to do these manipulations again. And another place I should mention that the escape key will save you is sometimes people have a problem where they're using this drawing tool. Maybe they're trying to create some extended or interesting shape, but then they get stuck here and they just can't get out of this clicking situation. And you can solve that again by just hitting the escape key. One hit of the escape key will take you back to the pointer. And if you hit it again, it will take you back to the pointer tool. And then you can manipulate this monstrosity you've created however you like. Now, there are a lot of other tools here that we haven't covered in Lightburn yet, but we're actually gonna jump straight into a project because we're going to hit a bunch of those other tools that you'll need to know as we're doing our sample design projects. And I think that will help you understand them a lot better by actually using them in the context of a real project. So let's get right into that. So now we're gonna design this little gift tag that I showed at the beginning of the video. And the first thing we need to do is actually just select our text tool. So over here on the left-hand side of Lightburn, we have this little A-shaped letter. Just click on that and that will give you the text 
tool and then you can just click anywhere on the grid to get your cursor. And so then I'm just gonna type in Natalie. So that'll be our name for this gift tag. And then there's a couple of other things that we'll want to adjust here. So first of all, you want this to be a particular height, right? You don't want it to be like random or set by default. And for this type of tag, I like to use something around one inch. And so in Lightburn, you can adjust that by just going over here. And I have it set to two inches here and I have just one. And so I'm gonna keep that setting. But if yours is something else, which it probably will be, you can adjust that right here. And then you can also change the font. So there's a ton of different fonts here that you can use. At, for a, a name like this on a gift tag, I think this one is, is pretty good. I don't know how to pronounce that. It's something like Kokonor, I'm guessing. Um, and so I'm just gonna set it there and we're going to call that good for the font. So the next thing we need to do is create some sort of outline around this, right? Because we also want to be able to cut it out. And if we just have this, we're just have the engrave part for the letters. And so to get that outline, there is a very handy tool that we can use called offset. And it's this little O over here on the left-hand side of Lightburn. So I'm just gonna go ahead and click that. And what it does is it just creates a line outline organically around your shape. And so you can change the offset distance to make it bigger or smaller. I'm just gonna make this simple and go for a 0.2, which looks about right to me. So let's go with that. The next thing we're gonna need to add is something for this little eyelet hole here so that we can put some thread or string or something through there. So let's make that next. So we're gonna need to use our circle tool over here on the left-hand side of Lightburn. And I'm just going to make myself a nice little circle like this. That looks about right. And for this one, I'm going to uh, go back to my selector and rotate it a little bit so I can have it offset and sort of uh, uh, aligned with the, the name in a way. And then I'm just going to kind of overlap it like this on the edge where I want that hole to be. So now we have two different shapes here, right? But we want them to be combined. And there's another handy light burn tool that you can use to do that called the weld tool. In order to do that, we have to select both of the shapes that we want to be combined. And so I'm just going to hold my, uh, my uh, uh, Mac button. It's the like command button on, on Windows. I believe it's the control button. And so I'm gonna select both of these. And then once you've done that, then you're going to select this button here, which is weld all selected together. And then boom, both of these individual shapes are now one shape, which is pretty cool. And then we have our space in order to add that little eyelet key. So now there's one more thing missing in our shape and that is an additional hole inside of this new shape that we added um, in order to create the cut for the string to feed through. So now we're going to need our circle tool here again. And next, I, I want actually this one to be a perfect circle instead of a, a uh, like, cylinder or, or whatever, or an oval. <laughs> That's the word I'm looking for. And so in order to do that, you can always create a perfect version of the shape you've selected by holding the shift key. So I've got the circle selected. I'm gonna hold shift on my keyboard and that's gonna give me a perfect circle, okay? So I've got my perfect circle here. I'm gonna hit escape so that I can select this and then I'm gonna move it over here. Now, just like with the name, we want this circle to be a particular size, right? And so I'm gonna show you how to set that size now. So to know what size you want for this hole, you kind of need to know the size of whatever you want to feed through it. So now with this type of gift tag, my wife and I have actually made these for our Etsy store as like a nice little add on for the packaging for a custom product that we've made for somebody. And so from the type of twine that we use, I know that the hole is usually not going to need to be any larger than 0.18 inches. And so if I know that I can just select my circle here and then go up here to the width and height in the top of light burn here. And I can just change this to 0.18 and that's going to adjust the size of my circle, okay? So I know this is gonna work well for the twine that I'm using for this project. And what you might've noticed here is when I adjusted the width of my circle, it automatically adjusted the height. And that's because this little lock key is on. And if I was to undo this, it would unlock the aspect ratio and that circle would be able to change only in one dimension. So let me just show you that real quickly because this is useful in some situations. So I, I went back to the original size of the circle. Now I'm going to change just the width to 0.8. Now you can see it turns into an oval. Now I don't want that. I just wanted to show you that you can do that if you need to for your design. So I'm going to relock this aspect ratio and do 0.18. And then I'm gonna have the circle of the appropriate size. And I'm just going to move it a little bit until it looks right for my design. And then we're gonna have it. 
So there we go. Now that we've finished designing our basic shape here, we need to work on setting the layers, okay? Because we're gonna do some engraving and cutting here, so we're gonna need at least two layers for a project like this. And so I'm gonna try to do this the simplest way possible, and I'm just going to start by selecting everything that I want to be engraved, okay? And so in that situation, we're just going to want our name piece. So I've selected our name piece here, and what I'm gonna do next is I'm going to go down here to these colorful boxes on the bottom, okay? And I'm just going to click this zero one blue box, okay? And what it does here is it's just going to change the color of that and it's going to add a new layer over here on this right hand box called cuts and layers. If you do not have this cuts and layers box showing, then you can easily display it by just right clicking on whatever you do have here displaying cuts and layers by just checking that box if it's not checked. And then if it's down here, uh, if it's still not showing, you can come down here and just click whichever one says cuts and layers like I have here. So just in case you didn't have that visible, that's how you make it visible. So I've selected everything for engrave and I've set it to blue. So that's the first step. And then I'm going to select everything that I want to cut. So that'll be the outline and my circle. So I've selected all of that. And I'm going to click this little red box here with the, the number two on it, okay? So now I have a blue and I have a red. And so I've separated my engrave and my cut into two layers, and now I need to actually set the power and speed settings appropriate for those things. But before we do those settings, I wanted to quickly mention a little tip here. So these little boxes at the bottom, 00 through 29, it doesn't really matter which of these you choose for your layers, but as a best practice, it can be helpful to do some basic color coding here. So you may notice that I used a blue for my engrave and then red for my cut. So if I were to expand this design to make it more complex with multiple layers on top of this, then it could be helpful for me to use more reddish tone colors as my other cuts and more bluish tone colors for my layers of additional engraves. And so that's just a helpful little system that you can use when you get into doing larger amounts of layers. It's not a perfect system, but I think it is helpful. So just a little note there. If you're an observant person, then you may have also noticed these little names here that are assigned to each layer. And you may have also noticed that even though we're using blue as an engrave, it has a name that is small cut. Now that's actually not going to determine anything to do with our speed and power settings, so it won't actually affect the job. But for organizational purposes, if you'd rather that say something else, all you have to do is come over here to the layer section and double click on that layer and it opens up a whole pane of other settings and we won't go through all of these here. That could be a topic for another day. But what you can do if you wanna change these names for organization, you can just come right here, change that name and you're good to go. Now back to our power and speed settings. Now in order to do this perfectly for your design here, what you're actually going to need to do is to run a test file like one of these. So this is the engrave test file and the cut test file. And the reason that this is important and why you may have seen some of these online is because the actual power and speed you need will depend on the specific material you're using and on the specific laser you're using. And so in order to get these dialed just right, then it does help a lot to run this type of test card. The good news is if you don't have one already, you don't need to buy one or make one yourself. I have these already and you can get them for free. <laughs> so just go down to the description below and you can get both of these test files on my website for free. And so go get that there and then that will allow you to go to the next step because what you're gonna do is run these tests, look at the results, see the cleanest cut that you like with the material you're going to make your name tag out of. And then similarly, look at the engrave card and find the box that represents the best speed and power for the level and the darkness of the engrave that you like best for your design. And then you're gonna use those to input into the layers like I'm gonna show you to do for this gift tag right now. So I've already run test cards and I've actually made a few of these tags already. And so I'm just going to go ahead and now fill in the settings that I know will work well for my material and my laser. And so first what I'm gonna do is for my engrave layer, I'm going to set from line to fill because for an engrave, I need it to actually fill in the situation. And that basically just means all of my shapes are going to be filled, thus the name, in with uh, engraved dark color. And so I'm gonna select that fill and then I'm going to um, select this layer, the blue layer, and I'm going to go down here and just manipulate these settings here in the pane on the right hand side. And for this one, I know that my speed is going to need to be 
11,000 millimeters per minute. And I know my laser needs to be set to a power of 70%. And this is just going to be one pass. So I'm going to make the pass count one. And then the interval. So this one is, is interesting and it's a little bit complicated to understand if you really wanna go deep down the, the rabbit hole. But as I understand it, basically in those situations, you're going to want this to be set to roughly the dot size of your laser. And I'm running an Xtool D1 Pro 20 watt module here for this project. And so I am going to put in 0 0.08 which is roughly the size of the, the dot on that laser module. Okay, that pretty much does it for the engrave. So now we're going to do the cut layer. So I'm going to click on the red layer here and I'm going to enter in my settings. Now for this one, we need it to be line, not fill because it's cutting a line, thus the name, so it's a line. And what I'm going to do here is put in 650 millimeters per minute, which is my cut setting. And then my max power will be 80 and then I'm going to do two passes. So this tends to be the best for this type of project in my situation here. And then we are pretty much it. That's basically all we need to do for the layers for now. And so what we're gonna do next is we're actually going to move on to our second project. I'm gonna show you how to do that one. And then I'm going to show you how to do the framing or alignment with your laser and also then the, the cut of both of these projects at the same time. So let's go ahead and make our second project here right now. Now we're gonna do a slightly more advanced project and that is this little hot air balloon. But don't worry, it's still relatively simple and it will illustrate some additional tools that we haven't used yet in this video. And so this little hot air balloon was actually designed by my wife on an app called Procreate on her iPad. Now one of the things about this app is that it does not allow you to export what are called vector files. And a vector file is basically anything that you create directly within Lightburn is a vector file. But a lot of other things, like if you take a picture on your phone, that's a JPEG. And so there's a bunch of different file formats. And so if I have a design that looks something like this, in order to get it to work in Lightburn, I can export it as an image like a JPEG and then actually use a tool called the trace tool in Lightburn to transform that JPEG into a vector file, which we can then use with our laser. And so that's where it all kind of comes together. And so that's what we're gonna do right now for this hot air balloon project. So the first thing we need to do is import our image. And there's two main ways of doing that. First, you can use this button up here in the top left corner to go through your computer's file system to find the image and import it that way. But personally, I like to use the other method, which is just simply to open up the picture and then click and drag into your workspace like so. Once you have it in your workspace, I'm just gonna shrink it down a little bit, and then I'm going to right click on that image and go down to the trace image button and click on that. Then it's gonna open up a new window for trace image, and when you have a very simple design, like this simplified version of our hot air balloon, then it's going to do a pretty good job of creating a pink outline all the way around your shape. If it doesn't do a good job on the first time, you can play with these settings like the threshold to adjust this to try to get the pink to go exactly where you want it to go. And there's also this setting here that allows you to ignore less than. And that's basically if you have some stray little pink dots or pixels, that's just because the, the software didn't know exactly where the lines were supposed to be and it might have some scattered pink dots. And you can adjust that just by putting in a higher number here, like 50 or something like that. So there are other settings here. We're not gonna go in depth into all of them, but suffice to say that you can adjust things and manipulate things until your outline looks just right. Since it's so simple, we're just gonna go with the default here and click okay. Once we do that, we're going to get an outline. It's basically taken our JPEG image that we imported and converted it into this vector outline. And this is great because then we can go ahead and use this like a design that we created ourselves directly in Lightburn. We have it assigned to this, this layer and we could just put in our settings and set this up right away for a cut and that would be awesome. And so that's kind of the first part of this process, but let's make things a little bit more advanced. And so the next thing that we can do is actually bring in another layer with another image. And I'll show you how I can lay that over the top of this to make a like multi-layer design with multiple images. So let's do that now.
Okay, so now I'm bringing in my second image, which is going to be our engrave layer. And right off the bat, one thing that you might wonder is, well, why wouldn't you just import your total image of the hot air balloon all at once? So if you have your, your drawing or your sketch or whatever, just import it all at once. And the answer is you can do that, and we have actually done that. But what you have to do sometimes is create multiple traces to get the outline and then the engraved parts all done just right. And so sometimes it's actually simpler to separate some parts of your design in the images before importing them into Lightburn just to make the trace function easier. And so that's one reason you might do this here, but also I'm going to demonstrate some things here with the alignment tools that I think are useful regardless of whether you're doing an image trace like this or if you're just designing something from scratch in Lightburn. So I'm kind of showing this for all of those reasons so that you can see these tools, and so that's just a little bit of context. That said, let's get right into it. So. I'm gonna right click here just like I did with my new image and I'm gonna click trace again. And as you can see here, there is a little stray pixel. I kind of alluded to this in the last bit there and to get rid of that, I'm just going to come over here and enter a higher number. So let's try 20. And yep, that got rid of that little pixel. And it looks like otherwise our lines are relatively clean. So I'm just gonna go with this and hit okay. So now I have two different uh, designs here. I have the original outline and I have my engrave. And now I need to do a couple of other things to get these combined and aligned perfectly. So the first thing we need to do here is actually to resize the shapes themselves because they just came in with the defaults from the trace function. So I'm just going to start with the first layer that we traced in. And I know that I want this to be about five and a half inches tall when I'm done. So I'm just going to enter in a height of 5.5. Now I want this other shape, the second layer that we traced in, to be the same size, but it doesn't really have the basket down here, so it won't actually be the same height as the first shape, but they will be the same width. And so I'm just going to click that first shape we resize and look at what the width is. Okay, we can see here the width is 3.7442, so I'm going to select our second shape and just enter in 3.7442, and because the aspect ratio is locked, this should also give us the appropriate height for what we want to do. So now we're going to get into some of the alignment features that are really helpful for putting shapes or layers like this together. So for the alignment, I just need to first select both of these shapes, and then I'm going to do a align vcenter. So I just click this button, and then I'm going to vcenter, and that's going to uh, vertically align these two shapes, and then I want to top align them. So I'm gonna click this button and then go to align top. And now our shapes are all perfectly combined without us having to finagle and try to kind of guess how things go together, which can really, really help when you're doing this sort of a job where you have multiple layers for one design. And since we have a cut and engrave part of this project, I now actually need to separate these two layers so that we can enter the appropriate settings. And so I'm just going to select the internal layer here for the engrave and put it onto a separate blue layer. And that leaves one last job, which is entering the speed and power settings for both of these layers. This is a different material than we used for the, the keychain or the, the gift tag, I should say. And so I'm just going to quickly fill these in and you can kind of watch as I'm doing it. So for the cut, we need to put in, for this one, 425, because it's thicker material here, and I like to do 80% power and two passes. And then this is line, so that's correct, and then I'm going to go to the blue layer. Now this is selected for the fill, so that is correct, and then I want to do 11K by 60 this time and it looks like our interval is already correct, so that should be good. So those are our settings. Now we'll move on to the next step. And another thing you might wanna do with your light burn design here is actually to run a preview. So you can do that with everything selected here by just clicking this little TV screen looking icon at the top. And that's going to give you a preview, and this shows you a lot of useful information that you can use as a check before you actually run your project, including how long it's estimating it will take to complete, and also some other information about how it's going to go about the laser path, so you can kind of see the whole projected path of the burn. And so this is useful to use before running your final job. So that's there. Okay, now that we've finished the Lightburn files for our two projects, the next thing we need to do is framing or alignment. And there are a bunch of different ways to do this, but I'm going to show you the three methods that I think are the easiest. And then once we've got that set for both of these files, we're actually going to run these 
projects and burn them out so that we can see the final result. So let's get started with the framing and alignment. So before we can get into the real alignment steps here, we have to do a couple of setup steps to make sure we're ready to do it correctly. And so the first thing we need to do is to focus our laser to make sure it's at the appropriate height or Z axis height. And so we're gonna do that now. Now different lasers do this process differently, but for my x D1 Pro here, I have a little kickstand. I put that down, rest it on the material, tighten my module into place, and then put the kickstand away. Now I know different diode lasers sometimes have a tool that allows you to do this, and other larger lasers, like for example, bigger CO2 lasers, will sometimes have other mechanisms or even automatic tools that do this for you. But in any case, if you need to focus your laser, then we need to do that now. Once the laser is focused, we also need to make sure that it is in the appropriate home position. So a lot of lasers that have homing switches or larger, more sophisticated devices will kind of do this for you automatically. So some of you won't have to worry about this, but if you have a diode laser or if you have a laser that does not have homing switches, then you need to make sure that before you turn the laser on, the laser head module is in the appropriate location. Now my x D1 Pro does have homing switches, but I've actually turned them off for reasons that I talk about in another video. And so I'm going to manually home my laser by just putting it in the top left corner of the laser, which is the default homing location for a lot of lasers. Now I'm gonna start by showing you the, I guess, quick and dirty method, which is the first method that I learned to use for framing a laser in place. And that is by just creating a square. So I'm selecting a square here in Lightburn, and I'm just going to make it around my shape. So I'm just going to kind of align it and make sure it fits around my shape without bumping up against it. And then I'm going to put this on its own layer. So I'll use this little gray layer here and I'll go to my cuts and layers. And what I'm gonna do now is I'm actually going to just set this to fire the laser on an extremely low setting. And so I'm gonna do a relatively high speed for this. So we'll say 4,000 millimeters per minute. And then I've learned that with my 20 watt laser, the lowest power that I've found that I can use while still being able to see the laser dot on the material in order to make sure that it's framing correctly is actually 0.3. So very, very low power percentage, which is a good thing for this purpose. And then for the pass count here, what I'm gonna do is put in two or maybe three passes so that I actually have time to position my material, which is especially helpful if you're doing something that needs to be framed perfectly. So for example, you might be able to see here, I have these like plaques that I've made where the material is already set and then I wanna frame it. You could do that with absolute coordinates by making a template, which is something we'll talk about later, but you could also do this by doing like a little frame and just trying to shift things around until the laser perfectly frames the outline, which is actually how I made that one. And so this is one method. There are a lot of methods like I mentioned. And so once we have this, um, these settings in, I have my 4,000 low power and I'm doing two passes. I'm going to make this the top layer. So I'm gonna reposition this to up here. And then I'm going to turn off the output, importantly, of my real layers. So both my cut and my engrave layers here, I'm going to turn off the output. And what this is going to do is if I run this job, if I like press start and run this job, it's going to only run this layer because it's the only one with the output switch on. And that's important because then it's only going to run my little engrave line path. So this is basically a layer which has the sole purpose of showing me where the laser job is going to be. And so I'm going to go ahead and run this now for our little, um, our little project to see, show you how this can be done with this method. I've just put my safety glasses on and turned my laser on, and you may want to put on some safety glasses before you turn on your laser as well. So just a reminder about that. And then what we need to do here is because I have already homed my laser like we talked about earlier, I need to now move it into position of this little green dot because for this job, my job origin is this green dot because I've just so happened to have set it to the top right corner here in this job origin section. And I'm going to be running this as a current position project, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, but suffice to say, I need it to be at that green dot in order for this to work. So in order to move my laser there, I can use this little map tool here by clicking on that and then just simply clicking on my green square. Sometimes you have to click it twice to get this to work, but once you get it there, then we're in good shape and we can move on to the next step. 
Now I'm just gonna move my wood material here such that the top right hand corner is right about where my laser head module is because we are using that job origin. And then from there we can go ahead and frame our project. And when we start the frame, basically what we do is just come back into light burn. We make sure our settings are, are how we want them with just the laser framing layer on for the output and the other two off. And then you can just click start. And once you click start, you can see the laser head module is just going to go ahead and trace that rectangle we've created and it's gonna do two pass passes just like we specified. Now that our material and laser head are in position, we can come back into light burn and we can just turn off our framing layer and then turn on the output for the other two layers we have here. Once that's ready, I can go ahead and just click start and here's what the laser looks like running at the beginning here. We'll check back in on the finished product at the end of the video, but first let's finish our second project. Okay, now I've opened our other little project here, the gift tag, and I'm gonna show you how to use the second framing method. And this is honestly probably the one that I personally use the most now. And it just kind of is because of the types of projects I'm doing. And so you may have noticed in Lightburn here, these little frame buttons. There's the square one, and then there's the circle one here on the right hand side. And if you've seen those, you may have wondered like, how do I use them? What do they do? Or maybe you've tried to use them and they've been a little bit different than you expected. And so running the type of laser that I'm running before we use, we actually need to do some settings in the device settings for the specific laser we have. So I have the Xtool D1 Pro that I'm running, as I've mentioned. And for this, I need to go to file and actually go to edit and then go down to device settings. And then this is going to open the settings specific to my laser. So you can see here, it's for the Xtool D1 Pro specifically. And so if you have multiple lasers, you may have to do this multiple times to get it to work for everything you're running. And so you'll notice here, there are some other options set here. And um, what you can do here is there's a setting called enable laser fire button. And it has a warning here that you should pay attention to because it's warning you that this can be very dangerous for CO2 lasers. As I mentioned, I'm doing this all on a diode laser and so that's why I'm able to use these settings. Um, and so pay attention to this if you have a CO2 laser, safety first and all that jazz. But for my purposes here and the way that I'm doing this, I'm going to turn this enable laser fire button on and also the laser on when framing button and that's how I'm going to use this next bit. Okay, and then I'm gonna push okay. And then the next thing that we need to do settings wise is there is a move tab. And so I'm gonna to go to that, I have it here. If you don't see this or you don't have it in your options, you can just right click, make sure move is selected. If it's not, check the box, it'll pop up here and then you can click on it. Okay, and so here in the move box is actually for, for my type of diode laser, it's where we're going to have our settings for the, the frame button. And so this power here is the power that will be used in the framing job um, that is activated by these buttons here in the laser pane, okay? And so I have this set to 0.3. And as you may remember from our first framing example, I use 0.3 as my uh, power for my outline framing layer. And so I'm using the same power here. And so once I've done that, I also need to set um, some other settings here. I put in 4,000 millimeters per minute for the speed and I put in one inch for the distance. And so these are basically going to determine um, how fast your laser moves when you use the like move buttons and the, the move settings. And the distance is basically how far it's going to move if you click the button like one time. Um, so that's, that's basically how it works in essence. And the important thing is that we need these settings to be done in order to use these frame things. So now I'm going to focus my laser since this is a different material with a different thickness. And then I'm going to home my laser and then I'm going to go ahead and put my safety glasses on and turn on my laser. Now that my laser is on, I again need to put the position of the laser head to this little green square. So I'm going to use this tool again. 
Now that my laser head and material are in position, I can go ahead and click this frame button. Now I have a choice between two frame buttons. I can use the square one or I can use the circle one or the rubber band boundary. Personally, I like to use the rubber band one usually, especially for something like this, because oftentimes I'm going to be cutting something like this out of scrap wood and that allows me to make sure my design is not hitting into any of the existing holes in that piece of wood. And so I'm gonna go ahead and click that and here's what the frame looks like with the laser running. As you can see, this method of framing is pretty similar to the first one. It's just a little bit different in how you go about it and which buttons you push and how you use the settings. So now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm going to start this project because our material is lined up with the laser appropriately. And as you can see, our laser is getting going. And I had one more trick that I wanted to show you here for framing, and this is particularly useful for those of you who are trying to align and center a design on top of an object. So for example, if you're trying to do an engraving on a coaster, this is a method that you could use to make that alignment easier. And so the way we're going to do this is actually using absolute coordinates. And so I'm going to just change on the right hand side here from current position to absolute coordinates. And you'll notice that the green box that we've been using now jumps over to the left hand corner. And another thing you might notice about my work area here in Lightburn is that I have a very long work area and that's because I had the extension kit on my Xtool D1 Pro. And so if you uh, are seeing something here that you think is maybe not perfectly aligned with the laser you actually have, then you can edit it by going back to device settings in the edit menu and you can adjust the working size here. Usually this will be correct when you run the initial setup of your laser, but if you have any issues with it, this is where you can make adjustments. And so with that said, what we're basically gonna do here is I'm just going to get a little piece of cardboard and I'm going to create a template for our design. And I'm going to put this into my laser and we're basically just going to engrave an outline of the object to help us place it there. And this is really handy and it is actually a trick I learned from Louisiana Hobby Guy who's here on YouTube and probably knows more about Lightburn than anybody else on YouTube if you haven't seen his channel yet. Um, but at any rate, this, uh, let's, let's go through this example as if we were doing a coaster. Let's say, for example, we're doing these slate coasters here on Amazon, and you can see here that the di diameter of these coasters is four inches. And so let's go ahead and make ourselves a little template for uh, one of these. So I've got the circle tool here in Lightburn, and I'm going to make this one a perfect circle, so I'm holding the shift key. And then uh, let's say these are four inches in diameter, but let's say just to give ourselves a little extra wiggle room to make this a bit easier, I'm gonna do just 4.1 inches as an example. So now I have my circle here, and what I'm gonna do next is I'm just going to align it in my space to, whoops, align it in my space to where I want it to be on the workbed itself. And so I'm just going to give it an X position of 11, which is kind of middle-ish of my work bed. And then I'm just going to put it way at the top, let's just say 0.1 in the Y coordinates. So I'm putting it roughly middle at the top of my work area just to make this easier to do. And so now what we're going to do is I'm going to just quickly adjust uh, the, the engraved settings here. I've actually already put them in and these are ones that I just know from my own past experience that I can do an engrave on cardboard with my laser with a 300 millimeter per minute speed and a power of 15%. And so I've got my settings in here already. And so the next thing I need to do is go position my piece of cardboard over on the laser bed. So let me jump over there now. So as you can see, I'm just putting this piece of cardboard pretty much at the top of my work bed, roughly where it shows on the light burn where, where my project is going to be. And you may also notice that my piece of cardboard is pretty nice and flat and that's helpful here. But if you had sort of somewhat warped or bendy cardboard, you can weight it down with some little magnets like this, and that is, is helpful. And so now that I've got this lined up, we also need to make sure that the laser is focused, of course, because this is a different material size, so make sure your laser is focused if you need to do that, like I do here, and then we can move on to the next step. Now I've got my safety glasses back on and I've got my laser on, and so now I'm just going to go ahead and frame this job. As you can see, this looks like it's pretty well aligned, and so I'm just gonna go ahead and start my project. Now that we have our outline, we are going to want to actually move the laser head a little bit so that we'll have space to put whatever we want, like our coaster, over into our template area. And so without moving the cardboard at all, I'm just going to use this uh, location tool here to just move the laser over here. 
Now that the laser's out of the way, we can position our coaster or whatever we have to go here. I don't actually have one of these slight coasters, so I'm just kind of showing this as an example. Now back into Lightburn here, I want to just show you how you could position your design on the Lightburn space in order to work together with the template that we've positioned on the workbed. And so now I'm just going to create a real simple sample design here. I'm going to get my text cool tool and I'm just going to do a wow explanation mark. And uh, then I'm going to take this and I'm going to select that and my circle so that I can do the alignment tools that we talked about earlier. So I'm going to align center and then I'm going to align H center. So that's centered right in the middle of the circle now. Um, but we don't want the, the new wow that I just created to at the same time re-engrave our circle. So I'm just going to move the, the uh, circle part to a new layer and I'm going to turn off the output on that layer such that my wow is the only thing that we're going to be engraving. And so now that we have this set up, even though we've moved our laser over to the side, if I go ahead and start this job, then it will engrave right in the center of that template we've created. So I'll go ahead and start this. Now here you can see our final product, and as you can see, the wow is dead center in the middle of this circle. I should mention that we kind of skipped a step because I don't actually have a slate coaster to show this with. I didn't refocus the, the laser head again to fit another material because we're just doing it again on the cardboard. But of course, if you had another material, you would probably have to adjust the height of the laser head module, but we're not doing this here for the reasons I mentioned. But the real beauty of this approach is if you had to do a ton of coasters, say you had to do like 20 coasters, one after the other, even if you had a small laser, you could make yourself a little template like this and put coasters on them, run it with absolute coordinates, take them all off, and then put a new batch on, run it again, and you could keep doing this and it allows you to kind of batch process your laser engraving if you want to do that. Now here we are with our finished project, so let's just take a closer look at them and see how they really turned out. First of all, the hot air balloon, I think this one actually turned out really well. It just has a little bit of laser scorching around the rope area, but we can clean that up really easily with just a bit of sandpaper. And then the Natalie gift tag here also needs a little bit of sandpaper around a couple of the edges, but otherwise the face turned out pretty well. But if we flip this over on the back, we'll see there's actually some chipping here and some of the edges of the design didn't cut out quite perfectly. And that's because when I ran this project, it didn't fully cut out of the wood and I actually had to finish up some of it with an X-Acto blade. And that's just part of this process. You'll see that things don't always turn out exactly like you expected and you have to make adjustments and you learn, you improve your process and that's how it goes. But I really do hope that you found this video Helpful. And if you have any corrections or additions that you'd like to add or let me know about, I'm learning this as I go too. So feel free to leave those in the comments section below. And as a reminder, if you want to get my test file to use for your own material tests, you can get that at my website for free at the link in the description below. And finally, a like and subscribe to the channel would be amazing if you found this useful. So until next time, I'll see you.